Hello, I'm Robert Benavides, and I want to go ahead and talk about Chapter 10, Files and Exceptions. Now, I'm going to go ahead and split this up into several parts, and this is going to be Part 1. So, first of all, let's go ahead and take a note at the cheat sheet for this chapter, Chapter 10. I'm going to go ahead and click on this and take a quick look. I like to look at this before and after I study a particular chapter. So this chapter is going to be about files, specifically about text files, and because there are different kinds of files, like say, for example, um, images, which are considered binary files. We're going to just zero in on text files, and then we'll move into some JSON files, which is a slightly different idea. So in this first section, we're going to talk just about reading from a file. Later on, we'll talk about writing to a file, talk about file paths. Uh, we'll also talk about exception handling. And the reason why exception handling is covered in a chapter like this is you can imagine if you try and open a file and the file doesn't exist, you're going to, your, your program is going to crash. You know, so you want to go ahead and um, deal with that kind of error. Of course, there's all kinds of exceptions, not just exceptions dealing with files. You could have an entire chapter on that. So, um, you know, we also cover exception handling. And then we also, at the tail end of this chapter, chapter 10, uh, talk about storing data with JSON. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a, re, it's a, it's a really neat chapter. One of my favorites. Um, it gets you used to, um, you know, to thinking about persistence, to thinking about uh, having data that will be there even after you close your program and you run it again. Uh, you know, certainly we could be dealing with a database, but then that's a, a different idea. We're only going to be dealing with data that is in a text file. Okay, so that is, you know, um, my little plug for the cheat sheets. Uh, and this particular one is on chapter 10, files and exceptions. Okay. All right. So um, at the beginning of this chapter, what will you learn in this chapter? In this chapter, you'll learn to work with files. So your programs can quickly analyze lots of data. You'll learn to handle errors. So your programs don't crash when they encounter unexpected situations. You'll learn about exceptions which are special objects Python creates to manage errors that arise while a program is running. You'll also learn about the JSON module, which allows you to save user data so that it isn't lost when your program stops running. So what are the benefits of learning to work with files? Learning to work with files and save data will make your programs easier for people to use. Users will be able to choose that what be able to choose what data to enter and when to enter it. People can run your program, do some work, and then close your program and pick up where they left off. Now that's the important point right here, pick up where they left off. Because you know if you just have a program that stores stuff in variables and then the program you close the program, then you have to like load all that stuff up again. So like say for example, you have a list of employees or a list of friends and stuff like that. Uh, once you uh, have that in a file, you can go ahead and run your program and read that stuff into your file so that you can go ahead and drill down on that data. Okay. So the other topic, besides dealing with specifically text files, we're also going to learn how to handle exceptions. You know, it's going to help you uh, deal with situations in which files don't exist and deal with other problems that can cause your program to crash. Like what? Like you ask, let's say you ask the user for a number and instead of typing in 10, they type in T-E-N. Well, that's going to cause the program to crash, right? So that's a different kind of exception, right? We're going to learn how to, to handle these different exceptions. So this uh, will make your programs more robust when they encounter bad data, whether it comes from, from, um, from innocent mistakes or from malicious attempts to break your programs. With the skills you've learned in this chapter, you'll make your programs more applicable, usable, and stable. Now, I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit more about this word robust. In computer science, that really is an important word. So if you go and look it up in the uh, Wikipedia, robustness, 
So robust programming is a style of programming that focuses on handling unexpected termination and unexpected actions. It requires code to handle these terminations and actions gracefully by displaying accurate and unambitious, unambiguous error messages. These error messages allow the user to more easily debug the program. So, you know, if your professor tells you that your program is not robust, that means it's, you know, there's times where it crashes or it doesn't give you the right data or it doesn't deal with the situation correctly, you know? So having programs that are robust is an important quality an important topic in computer science here. So you can see here, you can read a lot more about this topic of, of robustness uh, if you'd like uh, by clicking on that link. All right, so let's talk about, we're gonna just zero in in this particular section on reading from a file. So we're gonna turn over to the data in just a minute, but for right now, or the data to the programs in just a minute, but for right now, what? let's talk about what kind of data is found in text files. An, an incredible amount of data is, is available in text files. Text files can contain weather data, traffic data, socioeconomic data, literary works, and more. You can use data, uh, how can you use data in text files? Reading from a file is particularly useful in data analysis applications, but it's also applicable to any situation in which you want to analyze or modify information stored in a file. For example, you can write a program that reads in the contents of a text file and rewrites the file with, form, uh, with the formatting that allows a browser to display it. When you wanna work with a file, what's the first step? When you wanna work with a file, you know, with the information in a text file, the first step is to read the file into memory. You can read the entire contents of the file or you can work through a file one line at a time. And we're gonna go through each one of these situations. So let's go ahead and talk about reading the entire file. And then we'll talk about working through the file one line at a time. And so we'll, we'll, we'll drill down on the, on the different kinds of, uh, you know, situations that, that we may, um, you know, encounter. So reading the entire file. Let's say we have a file called pi underscore digits dot text. And of course, pi stands for pi, right? And, uh, you know, 13, thir uh, 3.14, et cetera. Um, so, you know, PISA goes on, you know, good, doesn't it, right? So we're only dealing with a small um, snippet of um, Pi uh, and we put it in a text file. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Of course, I could open it with like Notepad, but I opened it up here in um, Sublime. You know, when you're working with files in Sublime, you wanna go ahead and open the folder up and then you, you wanna have everything in the folder unless you specify a subfolder. And we'll talk about that in just a while. But let's go ahead and assume that this text file is in the same folder as the next file that I'm gonna go ahead and show you. So here's the text file. This is the file that we're going to read. This text file only has this data in it. So here is our uh, program, our script, if you will. Um, so this opens the file, reads it, and prints the contents of the file to the screen. So uh, let me go ahead and run it. And there it is. So basically you'll notice, uh, let's just go ahead and go over this um, uh, line by line. Um, let me just give you the top level view of this and then I'll drill down on, on, it, uh, on it in a lot more detail. Now we've got lines four, five, and six. So first of all, let's say what you see on line four is an enhanced new version of working with files. Before we had to, we, before we would open the, the file and then we would work with it and then we would have to close the file. But what would happen sometimes is that if you didn't close the file, you would leave your um, self open to errors. And um, that is dealt with, with this new coding style. 
So in line four, it says with open. And I just give it the name of the file as file object. So file object will represent the contents of that file. So if I go ahead and say file underscore object dot read, it's going to read everything and put it into a variable called contents. And then simply I go ahead and print it. OK. So let's drill down on this line four. First of all, you see open. Now, what is open? Open is a function. And when you say open and you pass it a string, it assumes that it's going to be for reading. Now, if you're real compulsive, uh, about syntax, you could go ahead and do something like this, where you would be explicitly designating that you're opening it up for reading. This is no problem. It, you get the same. Uh, the reason why some people like this is that later on, when we're going to be writing, then all we have to do is just change that R to W. And it, can, it has a, um, a um, compulsiveness in the syntax that many people like. So. The open function, what does it do? Uh, you know, it opens a file, you know, so that we can go ahead and work with it. And we're assigning that to file object. So to do any work with a file, even just printing the contents, you first need to open the file to access it. So the open function needs one argument, the name of the file that you want to open. Python looks for this file in the directory where the program that's currently being executed is stored. So you need to have your data file in the same folder that you're running your script, right? So in this example, the file underscore reader, that's this one right here. And I called it file underscore reader one because I'm going to have different variations, uh, you know, of this, um, is currently running. So Python looks for pi underscore digits dot text in the directory where the file underscore reader dot pi is stored. So the open function returns an object representing the file. That's this right here. That's an object, and it's going to represent this file. OK? So here, open pi underscore digits dot text returns an object representing py underscore digits dot text. Python assigns this object to file underscore object which we'll work with later in the program. A lot of people just put F, you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to get those bad habits out of your system. You know, F is for file. It kind of like makes sense, but we want to have good descriptive file names or excuse me, um, object names, variable names. So file underscore object is a much better descriptive name than just F. But um, you'll see situations where uh, a lot of people just use F for file. So the keyword um, with this keyword right here, this is a keyword as as is a keyword op on open is a function and file underscore object is an object. So the keyword with closes the file once access to it no longer is needed. Notice how we call open in this program, but not close. So we don't have to, right? The old fashioned way when we did the open, and we used, we used to do something like we would say F gets open, and then in the parentheses, you give it the, uh, the file name. So then F would then be, you could then say F dot read and assign that to contents and then print contents. And then you would have to say F dot close. So it was, it's an extra little step that we used to go through. So this is superior, but I think you need to know about the old way before you can appreciate what's being done here on line four. We don't have to close it because it's closed, being closed automatically. And that stops us from having those possible errors that we may have that can happen when you don't close the program um, that you're working on. You could open and close the file by, by calling open and close. But if a bug in your program prevents the close method from being executed, the file may never close. Yeah. So this may seem trivial, but improperly closed files can cause data to be lost or corrupted. Yeah, because it doesn't know where to go. So it gets corrupted, right? So if you call close too early in your program, you'll find yourself trying to work with a closed file a file that you can't access. 
which leads to more errors. It's not always easy to know exactly when you should close a file, but with the structure you're shown here, Python will figure that out for you. So it's done automatically, right? All you have to do is open the file and work with it as desired, trusting that Python will close it automatically um, when the uh, with block finishes execution. So this is the with block. So when it finished right here, it is closed, right? So once we have a file object representing pi underscore digits.txt, we use the read method, all right? And notice how I said read method. I didn't call it an object because uh, I didn't call it a function because file underscore object is an object and we're using the dot operator here. So read is a method. So we use the read method in the second line of our program to read the entire contents of the file and stores it as one long string in contents. When we print the value of contents, we get the entire uh, text file back. So read gives us the whole thing. Later on, we're going to learn all the other kinds of things that we can uh, use here. Like we can go, we can say read, uh, read line, we can say read lines. And needless to say, read line gives you one line at a time. And read lines is a, a, a way of creating, um, of putting all of those lines in a list. So that's pretty much where we're going uh, with this. Read gets the whole darn thing. Read line gives you one line at a time and read lines puts everything in a list and then you can iterate through the list. And that's kind of good for a memory uh, because you're only dealing with one at a time rather than you know, doing this brute force read, which you know, throws too much into memory all at one time. So the only difference between this output and the original file is the extra blank line at the end of the output. The blank line appears because read returns an empty string when it reaches the end of the file. This empty string shows up as a blank line. If you want to remove the extra blank line, you can use rstrip in the call to the print. So um, we can go ahead and do that, take a look at that. So uh, as we see here, notice the big difference here. Bef on line six, I just simply said print contents. And then in my next little demo I have here, I said print contents.rstrip. So see here, here's the output from the previous program. See how I've got this blank line there. So I'm gonna go ahead and run it again and see how that blank line is gone now because I stripped the, um, you know, the extra blank line uh, at the end of the uh, input. And that happens because the blank line appears because the read um, method returns an empty string when it reaches the um, end of a file. So recall that Python's rstrip method removes or strips any white space characters from the right side of the string. So now the output matches the contents of the original file exact exactly, compare both screenshots above. So let's talk about file paths a, a little bit more. When you pass a simple file name like pi underscore digits dot text to the open function, Python looks in the um, directory where the file that, that's currently being executed is stored. So in other words, they gotta be in the same folder, right? Sometimes depending upon how you organize your work, like if you have a massive program, you may wanna start putting things in folders and stuff like that. If you do that, if you put all your data in one folder, then you'll have to path out to it. So sometimes depending upon how you organize your work, the file that you want open won't be in the same directory as your program file. So because text files, because text files is inside of um, the, your current work directory, you can use a relative path to open a file from text files. A relative path tells Python to look for a given location relative to the directory where the current running program is stored. For example, let's go ahead and, and, and take a look at some examples. But basically, if it's relative, you don't put a, um, a slash in front of the folder because it is, a, it is a child to the current folder, right? So like, for example, let's look at this one here. See the situation here? I went ahead and put that file 
in a folder called text underscore files folder that's in the current folder. I, mean, I guess I could sh probably show you where that is. If I go file open file, I can see here is my current folder, right? And then I, I've got, I created this folder right in here called text underscore files. And inside of there, I ended up putting the file. You see where it is? And that is a child to my current folder that I'm in, right? If you were using the book, um, remember the book said to put everything in a, a, a folder called Python work. I have a different folder structure. The important thing is that this is going to be relative. Text underscore files is a child inside of my current working folder. Okay. So the other thing that you may want to do is when you go uh, file open folder, you may want to go notice I'm in the um, um, you may want to go ahead and make your current folder the current. This is not that important in Sublime, but it is important in Visual Studio Code. So we'll we'll talk about this concept uh, when we get to to the demos that I'm going to be using with Visual Studio Code. So when I run this, I get the same thing, but it is getting the file um, from the folder called text underscore files. So this is an example of relative path. Now, to, there, there's the other concept of the absolute path. So an absolute path, you would end up having a backslash in front of this opening folder. And if you're on the Mac, you know, your file path, if you're making absolute, would start from home and then your user folder and then et cetera, right? If you're on the PC, then you would start from, say, for example, the C drive. Um, the only thing is if you're on a PC, uh, instead of using slashes, you, you may end up using backslashes. And if you do that, then you have a problem with the uh, backslash T. So you'll have to use two slashes instead of one. But using the slash will work on uh, Windows or the Mac. So as you can see here, I'm using the slash. I'm not using the backslash. The backslash, guys, is hopefully you got the backslash would be that's the backslash, right? Right. So, and this is the slash, right? And this is right now, which is this is a relative path to this file because text underscore files is a child to the current folder that I'm in. So you can tell Python exactly where to where the file is on your computer, regardless of the program that's being executed or stored. This is called an absolute file path, okay? So you like, for example, I said, if you're on the Mac, you would say something like uh, slash home slash, and then your, um, your uh, you know, user account slash, and then maybe other underscore files or depending upon where you stored that folder. So you have to have a pretty good understanding of directory structures if you're going to be dealing with path. So if you try and use backslashes in a file path, you'll get an error because the backslash is used to escape characters in a string. For example, if you have a path that starts with C colon backslash and then et cetera, the sequence slash T, if you have that in your file, yeah, we would say like file, is interpreted as a tab. So if you need to use backslashes, you can um, escape each one in the path by adding two backslashes. Remember, because the first, the first one is an escape code, and then the next one would be a backslash. Okay. So um, when we're talking about right now, what I talked about, it refers to something that happens in Windows. So Windows systems use backslashes instead of the forward slash when displaying the file. But here's the big but, but you can still use forward slashes in your code. So I went, I just go ahead and just forward slashes all the darn time. I think that probably would be the safest thing uh, to do. I like to be consistent, you know, so go ahead and just use uh, forward slashes when you're creating a, a relative or absolute path, okay? So let's talk about reading line by line. That's this one here. And I'm going to go ahead and run it right away. And let's see what happens first. And we'll take it one step at a time. 
when you're reading a file, you often want to examine each line of the file. You might be looking for certain information in a file, or you might uh, want to modify the text in, uh, in the file in some way. So if you're looking for something, well, why you, you may not need or want to read in the whole thing in the memory. You may want to, once you get to what you need, then you can go ahead and just stop right there, right? So you can use a for loop on the file object to examine each line from a file one at a time. And that, of course, we're going to be seeing a little problem here, but we're going to deal with it. So for right now, you'll see here on my line four, I assign the file name, a string, to a variable called file name. Then on line six, I have my with statement, and I say with open file name. Of course, I could just put pi in there, pi underscore digits dot text right in here. But this style is a really good style because if you ever need to change the file name, you can just do it up here and in everywhere it's used in your program, whether you're reading or writing or appending or, because you could end up doing all kinds of stuff. You only need to change it one place. So this is a really, really good style to go ahead and use. So um, file name contains the, the name of the file. So then I, inside of this with statement, I'm going to embed a for loop. So I'm going to say for line. Why not line? Because it's a line, right? I mean, it could be. And you could use anything. I, I know a lot of people are going to want to use I, but we want to get away from one character or L or what. We want to get away from one character things, even though I already said a lot of people just use F for the file object. So we'll say for line in you know, file object because file object represents the file name, okay? So for every line in this file object, what do I wanna do? I wanna print that line. Now you'll notice now I have this blank line. Now, why am I getting that? Well, because the print statement, remember, gives you a carriage return line feed and there was already one in the other one. So that gives us the um, spacing problem that we have here, right? So, in this demo here, we assign the name of the file that we're reading from to the variable name file name. This is a common convention when working with files because the variable file name doesn't represent the actual file. It just, it's just a string telling Python where to find the file. You can easily swap out pi underscore digits dot text for the name of another file that you want to work with. After we call open an object representing the file and its context, contents is assigned to the variable file underscore object. We again use the with syntax to let Python open and close the file properly. To examine the file's contents, we work through each line in the file by looping over the file object. When we print each line, we find, every, we find even more blank lines. So, these blank lines appear because an invisible new line character is at the end of each line in the text file. And then on top of that, the print function adds its own new line each time we call it. So we end up with two new line characters at the end of every line, one from the file and one from the print function. So we need to use our strip on each line uh, in the print call to eliminate these extra blank lines. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at that and let me go ahead and run that and that eliminates. So we're really reading it in, you know, yes, we are getting the same output as we did before, but remember the first time we did this, we read the whole darn thing in. And this time, what we're doing is we're reading one line at a time. Now, we're not testing for anything. We're not looking for anything just yet. We're simply reading one line of uh, at a time. So basically, we put this number on three lines, and we're just printing it out one at a time. In fact, later on, if you wanted to, you could, you could instead of, uh, you know, if you would, uh, uh, you know, later on, we could, uh, instead of read, we can go ahead and use, you know, read line. Uh, on here, and that would read one line at a time, uh, at a time, but it's not in a loop. So the loop is better 
because you get all of it. If you just did, you know, read line, you would have to go ahead and know how many lines I got to read, you know. But this is a really good um, little um, design here. Uh, we have a loop embedded into the width syntax here that gives us the uh, output that we need. And the R strip method here eliminates the extra blank lines. So now we're going to graduate to the next idea here is uh, it, making a list of lines from a file. So when, when you use with the file object returned uh, by open or by the open function is only available, this is important, inside the with block that contains it. I'll re repeat that because it's important. When you use with, the file object returned by open is only available inside the with block that contains it. If you want to retain access to a file's content outside the with block, you can store the file's lines in a list inside the block and then work with that list. You can process parts of the file immediately and postpone some processing for later in the program. So this example that we're gonna look at in our next uh, demo here, uh, the following example stores the lines of uh, p uh, of pi underscore digits dot text in a list inside the width block and then prints the lines outside um, the width block. All right, so let's take a quick look at this. So the first thing I see uh, going over the whole thing is on line three, I, I assign the name of the file to file name. And then go ahead and run it and you get the same thing. So then I have my with syntax or with statement and I open that file name and file object represents that file name. So then what happens here is I'm using the method read lines. So object dot read lines, okay? Go, uh, is assigned to lines. So then I go ahead and, and what is lines? Lines is a, um, a list, right? So when I go ahead and say um, for line in lines, print and then strip it, you know? All right, so what if, let's just experiment on here. What if I go ahead and say print lines? What do you think? What do you think I'll see? So let me go ahead and read that or send that. Look at what I got here. Didn't I just say it, it, it made a list? Well, yeah, now I wanted to see that. And a lot of times it's important for me personally, and maybe for you, it's, it's not good enough to just say, yeah, it creates a list. I want to verify that it is a list. And I, if I look at the, the output here on the first line, see the square brackets? The first line of is the first element, and then it has that escape code, a backslash n, which gives me a new line. Remember that uh, the author's talking about the invisible new line? Well, guess what? I need to see it. So there it is. The second element is that next line, and guess what? It's got a new line, right? And then, you know, what happens here if I didn't if I went if I didn't have the uh, R strip in here, you know what's going to happen, right? The problem that we had before, right? In that, remember we said that the print function has its own carriage new line. So if I, if the print function is is printing each line and giving it a carriage return and then it already has a new line thing, that's why you're ending up with the two lines here. So that is why we have to end up using the dot operator to call the R strip, which strips the right hand side of the string of byte space or uh, characters, invisible characters, right? So that brings it back to the way it was. And of course, I'm going to get rid of this. I just wanted to show you that lines is a list. Remember lists? We covered that. What was it? Chapter three, something like that, right? So that's what uh, read lines does. Read lines will return a list. OK. Go ahead and make sure that it runs properly the way uh, it was intended to run. So the read line method 
takes each line from the file and stores it in a list. This list is then assigned to lines. So lines is the list, right? Which we can continue to work with after the width block ends. So the width block ends right here. And remember we said that, we said that, that, um, you know, it closes as soon as we get off of that. So how can we access the data? You go ahead and, and create the list and then we can use a loop to access the elements in the list. So we can use a simple for loop to print each line from lines. Because each item in lines corresponds to each item in a file, the output matches the contents of the file exactly. Right? So, you know, the file closed right here, right? The file closed. What we did is we got the stuff in there and we put it in a list and it's still in memory so that we can go ahead and then loop through that list, even though the file is closed, right? Of course, we're just reading. We're just reading. We're not doing any uh, updating at, at this point, right? Or modifying at all. So working with a file's content is the, um, you know, our, our, our next topic. Let me go ahead and run this. Okay. So after you've read a file into memory, you can do whatever you want with that data. So let's briefly explore the digits of pi. I think that's great. You can see he, you can tell this guy's got a math background. I, he's got a, a an undergraduate degree in physics, and then he went to graduate school in physics, and then did not finish. Uh, you know, decided to go and become a teacher instead. I believe in elementary school. So uh, that's what Eric. Uh, that's what his background is. So uh, and they just love pi, right? Mathematicians just love pi, right? So first will attempt to build a single string containing all the digits in the file with no white spaces in it. Okay. So that file, you know, so after we read the, the file in memory, you can do whatever you want with it. First, we'll attempt to build a single string. Uh, so that's what we're doing here it is, is, um, line eight, I go ahead and declare a string and assign the empty string to it. I loop through it, remove the, uh, the uh, uh, new line character. I print out the line and I give us the length. So this, this 36 here, that is how many, you know, that is the length of this string and that includes everything on there right it includes everything on there so above we start by opening the file and storing each line of digits in a list that's where we so remember this is the repeat of the idea that we had before that is a list lines is a list we've done that before so the only thing new here is on line eight is we create another another file uh, you know, on here called pi string. And then we loop through it and assign that line to this string. And then we print it out. Okay. So we create a variable called pi underscore string to hold the digits of pi. We then create a loop that adds each line of digits to pi string and removes the new line character from each line. We print this string and also show how long the string is. The variable pi underscore string contains the white spaces that was on the left side of the digits in each line, but we can get rid of that by using strip instead of R strip. Okay, so we did R strip, so we're going to go ahead and um, see that in another example here. Um, let me go ahead and run that. So as you can see here, we got the same as we got before. Let me go ahead and show you. All right, we got the number 36 was the length then, and then we do a run it here and we get the length 32. Why? Because of those white characters. 
I think it was like two spaces, right? So two and two and two and two, that's four. Four plus um, 32 is the 36. That's the difference in the uh, number of uh, characters. So the variable pi squared contains the, so we, we ended up using strip. Remember strip gets rid of the white space on the left side uh, uh, and, and uh, it removes white spaces on the left side of the digits in each line. Okay, I believe left and right, right? So it strips out the whole thing rather than just the right hand side. Okay. So when Python reads a text file and interprets all text in the file as a string, if you read in a number and want to work with that value in a numeric context, you'll have to convert it to an integer using the int function or convert it to a float using the float function. We don't have any demos of that, but basically, for right, so for right now, you just need to realize that we're dealing with string data right now. And, and, and that's, he uses a suffix on here, uh, you know, instead of, a, I guess a prefix would, would be at the beginning and the suffix is the end. So the variable name is pi, and then he uses this underscore and this, uh, you know, signifies that is that the data is a string. And then we're using the length function to find the length of this. So we pass it pi underscore string, and we find out that it, 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 it has a length of 32. Okay. What about larger files? Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Look at this big old file. This is pi. I wonder where he found that. This is pi. This is a text file, right? It's not because you know I could use Notepad to look to to, to look at this, but um, went ahead and just opened it up inside of Sublime because it's a text editor uh, anyway. So this is pi to one million digits, right? So actually, it's one million and two, right? Because or yeah, because of the three and the and the dot. If you were to count it, I'm giving the story away on here, right? So let me go ahead and, and uh, take a look at uh, my little demo here. Let me go ahead and run it. All right, so let me just give you the top level and I'll drill down on it. Line three, I, uh, I assign the file pi underscore million underscore digits dot text to a variable called file name, okay? So a uh, file has a, uh, this file has a big number, right? It's one million right digits uh, so not including the three and the, and the period so with open file name as file object then we're going to go ahead and use read lines and we're going to read it one line at a time and then we're going to go ahead and loop through this and um as we're looping through this we're stripping out you know uh, any kind of white space uh, characters on here and um then on line 12 we create a formatted string and we're only going to print out the first 50 decimals. You say, well, why did you put colon 52? Well, if I want the first 50 decimals, um, I'm going to want to include the three and the, the dot. So I have to go ahead and read in the first 52. So then when I uh, print the length of this string, I get one million and two, okay? Even though there's one million um, decimal places, uh, 50 decimal places. So, so far we focused on analyzing a text file that contains only three lines, but the code in these examples could work with just as well, uh, just, could, they could work just as well with large files or much larger files. Uh, if we start with a text file that, that contains pi to one million decimal places instead of 30, we can create a single string containing all these digits. We don't need to change our program at all except to pass it to a different file. Um, we'll also print just the first 50 decimal places. So in other words, this is 1 million and I'm getting only the first 50 decimal places. So we don't have to, to watch a million digits scroll by the terminal. And then he simulates that it's continuing on the uh, formatted string by putting in the dot, dot, dot. That's a very nice, very nice little uh, extra little touch 
you know, to simulate that it is continuing, right? So the output shows that we do indeed have a string containing pi to one million decimal places. Uh, so Python uh, has no inherent limit to how much data you can work with. Uh, you can work with as much data as your system's memory can handle. I guess that's the point right there. You could run out of memory if your system is not very, um, you know, does it have a lot of memory, right? So um, that brings us to is another manipulation here or another little um, program. And let's go ahead and find out whether our birthday is in pi. Okay, let's take a quick look at this. All right, let me go ahead and run and then we'll talk about it. So basically, well, you know, basically what it is, it's, it's the same file. And all it's going to do here is it's going to see if your birthday, which is going to end up being a six digit number, which is a string, right? We're going to go ahead and look to see if it's uh, in there, right? With, um, you know, uh, an if statement. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. Oh, uh, I forgot. Um, remember, you can't. You can't uh, go ahead. You cannot um, do uh, uh, input with Sublime. So you're going to have to do this inside of um, Visual Studio Code, or you can go ahead and do this in um, um, Idle. The other way that you, if you, if you really want to stay inside of, of Sublime, what you could do is you could always write all your code in Sublime. But then when it comes to running your program, instead of doing that control B, you can go ahead and just open up a command prompt, navigate to that folder, but you gotta be real good at folder structures. Look at all the folders I needed to, to go to, to get, you know, to my file. And, that's, and I'm just gonna go ahead and press the up arrow key to go through uh, the previous files or previous commands that I issued there. So to, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and run that because I am in the current directory. My current directory, I mean, you can create any, I called it uh, chapter 10 underscore P1 underscore reading from a file. Because I like to go ahead and when I'm studying something, I like to just have the files that are related to that just one idea. So as you all remember on Windows, to go ahead and run this, we issue um, the command to do that would be Python space and then the file name. My file name is pi underscore string three. I call it string three because I every single little demo I, that requires a little variation, I just go ahead and create another program for it. So let's go ahead and run it. So it's entering your birthday in the form. So I'm gonna go ahead and you gotta do like two characters, two characters, two characters. You can't just do one, right? So it's gonna mess it all up if you don't do it exactly this way, right? And your birthday appears in the first million digits of pi. So um, great. So uh, I know it's a it's a fairly nerdy little program, okay? Uh, but as you could see um, on line 14, I have my input function. So you enter in your birthday in this format that goes in the birthday, and it, and and it's a string. We because remember everything that comes in through input is a string unless I end up having to conver convert it with um, an, uh, you know like a if I wanted to be an int or a, or a flow. But we're not going to do that because we're going to accept it as a string. And then on line 16, I say if birthday in pi string. So it's going to go ahead and see if those six characters, I wanted to say digits, but it's not in their characters, right? Or in that file, pi string, which contains 1 million um, decimal places of pi, right? And if it is found in there, it says your birthday appears in the first million digits of pi. If it doesn't, it would then say your birthday does not. I wonder if anybody's birthday would, would end up going into uh, the else. I mean, part of, of that. I mean, uh, let me know if you all run this and your birthday's not on there. I'd like to know because I don't really, I don't really know whether all birthdays could be uh, found in, in that. Of course, this is just the first million. But what if you increase that to another million, two million, three million, ten million? You know, of course, you could probably increase the possibilities of you know of that. You know, 
uh, of course, uh, one way to like dumb this down is, is instead of 1 million digits, you could dumb this down to the first thousand and then run this to see uh, if you'll if the else clause will will fire on that. But um, this is a this is a good uh, I think a good little idea of the idea that that once we do read something, we can do searching for things that are in that file. And of course, this is a very elementary um, example of search. Uh, and we are using an if statement. We're saying if birthday in. So this in keyword will look for birthday inside of this string that we created. Excellent little demo. So remember, for, for this example here, if you didn't want to do it the way I did it, so I, I typed in my code in Sublime, and then I ran it by going into CMD, and I navigated to the current folder, and then I ran it saying, you know, Python space, the name of the file. If you don't want to do that, you can run it with aisle, you know, no problem. You can also use Visual Studio Code, right? To, and, and remember, the reason why we're doing that is because of the input function. When you run a file in Sublime with the input function, it just sort of like stops right there, right? It doesn't go anywhere, you know? So I did test it, it was idle, it ran with no problems. But when I went into Visual Studio Code, um, if I just opened up the file, if I go file open and I ran it, I would get an error message. But I found out if in Visual Studio Code that I, I should go ahead and say, file open, open up the folder and then the file, it ran okay. So apparently Visual Studio Code needs to know the, fold, needs to know the folder that you're in. Otherwise you're gonna end up getting an, um, a, an error when you're doing uh, working with text a file, when you're trying to access a text file uh, when you're using Visual Studio Code. Like I said, again, I didn't have a problem with idle. I didn't have a problem with you know Sublime. Uh, of course, I ran. I just ran this um, by navigating to the current folder. Uh, so I just wanted to, to warn you about that. If you if you're going to use Visual Studio Code, you got to make sure that you uh, you know that you that you go in and say open file. Click on file open. Do that first, and then um, and then um, and then open the file uh, inside of it so that it it knows what's going on, okay? So this program checks to see if a birthday appears anywhere within the digits of pi. Using a program that we're using, uh, using program that we just wrote, let's modify it to, uh, to see if a birthday appears anywhere in, in, in the first million digits of pi. That's what we just did. We can do this uh, by expressing each birthday as a string of digits and uh, seeing if the string appears anywhere in pi underscore string. So the point is this, once you read from a file, you can analyze its contents in just about any way you can imagine. Of course, we didn't do a lot of a, a lot of that. All we did was search, right? We did, we did a search with that uh, four line in lines, and it went through each one of them to, uh, excuse me, well, we did a, um, a search with line 16, if birthday in pi underscore string, and uh, search through it. All right, so let's go ahead and, and um, move on. Um, I want to go ahead and do the uh, try this um, yourself. But I want to go ahead and just go ahead just to, to break up the monotony. Uh, let's go ahead and, and um, uh, let's go ahead and use Visual Studio Code. OK, so. Here's the text file that I was talking about. And if you go, remember I was talking about go file open folder, you got to make sure that you're in the current folder. Like right now, my current folder here is the file, is the one that I talk, talked about, my chapter 10, part one. That's where I have every, once you do that, then you can go ahead and go file, open file, and then it, and you can choose from everything that's in that folder. Otherwise, the text files, will, they will not run right. You know, just trust me on that. I, I guess you could demo that. If you want me to, to do that, we could. But let's look at this first little uh, example on here. So this is example uh, 10.1, learning Python. 
It says open a blank file in your text editor and write a few lines summarizing what you've learned about Python so far. Start each line with the phrase in Python you can. So this is my text file right here. And I opened it up in, in Visual Studio Code, but you could do this in, in Notepad, right? Um, you know, so go ahead and save the file as learning underscore Python dot text. See? So save this file in the same folder as your exercises from the chapter. So yes, it is in the same folder, right? So if I go file open or open file, you'll notice that the text file is in the same folder as my script, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at the file, at the, uh, at the logic of this program. A little bit long, right? Not too much. And that's because it does three things. And, and it's kind of this, try it yourself, it's kind of like a summary of the whole chapter, kind of. So it says write a program that reads a file and prints um, what you wrote three times. Print the contents, number one. The first way we're going to do this, we're going to print it once by reading the entire file. That's done with the read method, right? We're going to print it again, looping over the file object. So that's done with this for loop right here, right? Okay. If you want to experience the difference of, and I think I already demoed that to you, the experience of, of running print and passing just line rather than the R strip, you end up with that extra uh, white space, right? So this is looping over the entire file. You're, you're looping it over the lines. So this one reads, the first one here on line five, reads the entire thing all in one all at one time this one you're getting it one line at a time one line at a time of course we're reading it in as you're reading it in you could be searching for something or doing something to it right uh, we'll cover that later on and then um if you wanted to access the data in other parts of the program you're going to go ahead and have to store the lines in a list so we're going to go ahead and repeat the same thing again by storing the lines in a list and then working with them outside the block. So here's the idea here is. On line 15, we have the with block. It goes all the way to 16. And it closes the file. As soon as I go ahead and, and get to 16, it's closed. So how in the world, you know, can I be dealing working with the data outside of this block? I have to go ahead and use the read lines method of the current object and assign it to a list called files. Now, if you want, if you do print lines, you'll see that the, the that it is indeed a list. Remember, I did I demoed that earlier to you. So you'll see all the little square brackets and the all that stuff. I think it's informative to do that. You got to prove it to yourself that it is indeed a list. So then, if I want, uh, so what's happening here? Is, is that we are reading everything and we're putting it into a list. Then we're going to go ahead and use a loop and iterate through that list. And we're going to use the R strip method to strip out the white space code at the end. So if I go ahead and I still think I'm in Sublime. Let me go ahead and run this one. And you can see that it does exactly what we thought it was going to do. So it prints it out one, two, three times. The first time is reading the entire file, and you get in the same result, looping over the lines, looping over the lines in a list. Now you may not be able to tell too much the difference between any one of these, or much maybe between the second and the third, but in the last one, we're looping through a list. We can go ahead and use that in other parts of the program. That's why it's important to, to understand this, how uh, this last example helps us to then um, access this in other parts of the program. So that is 10.1, 10.2. Uh, let me go ahead and, and look at that. 10.2, go ahead and run this. So let me just uh, talk through it, and then we'll come back and look at it. Um, 
if you can see here on line one, I assign the name of the file name to a variable called file name. And then I use a with statement and open the file. And I'm using read lines. Remember what read lines does? It, what does it do? It creates a list. Then I use a loop to loop through this list and print it out. And now, this, now, we're, now we're really kicking it up a notch. Now, not only are we reading, you know, reading this list, but we're using the replace method to replace Python or to replace C with Python. No, 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 replace Python with C. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, when it says uh, when it says Python, instead of saying in Python, it's going to say uh, in C. So it's going to find Python and it's going to put C in its place. And here's the output working just as we thought. So you can use the replace method to replace any word in a string with a different word. Here's a quick example showing you how to replace, you know, something. So the syntax for this is replace is you know, you, you say you're going to look for dog. So you're going to look for every instance of dog and you're going to replace it with what? Cats or cat, right? Um, so you read in each line from the file that you just created and replace the word Python uh, with the name of another language, such as C. Print each uh, modified line on the screen. Now, if you go ahead and look at the... Um, Python Crash Course Solutions Online, he throws in an extra modification to this particular one. Let me go ahead and show you. He introduces the concept of something called chaining. So Eric talks about something called chaining. It's not in, I don't think it's in, it's not in the book. Um, so yes, you can, R, you can, you can use R strip and replace on the same line. This is called chaining methods. Chaining methods is what it's called. In the following code, the new line is stripped from the end of the line, and then Python is replaced by C. The output is identical to the code shown above. So it does exactly what we did before. Let me go ahead and run this, and I'll, I'll show you the, see how it's exactly before. Let's look at line eight. So we say print line dot R strip, and then we put in another period another dot notation, and then we, we use the replace method. This is called chaining methods. In comparison, this, in this case, uh, we did it on two lines. It's just a style. I think, you know, advanced programmers are probably going to want to do it the second way rather than doing, you know, rather than typing in two lines of code, they're probably going to like this better. But um, Either one is fine uh, for me. In fact, you know, you know, if it's easier on your brain to go ahead and, and do it either way, whatever way is fine. Just for our purposes here, uh, this technique is called chaining methods. All right, my friends. Well, that's the end of this chapter. No, not chapter. The first part of this chapter. Uh, all we did was covered reading, and the in the in the, in the next sections that are coming up. We're going to talk about writing. Then we're also talk. We'll talk a little bit more about other topics. Um, you know, we'll talk about exceptions, and then we'll talk about JSON files. And you know, each one of these could be entire chapters. I mean, I've seen entire chapters on on exception handling. I've seen entire chapters on on JSON, and and um, you know, it's just um, you know, it's just the beginning, just the beginning of these topics, and. Uh, I hope to see you in the in the next video. I hope you picked up something uh, of value that you learned, um, you know, uh, in in this uh, particular video in in relation to um, reading files. It's actually quite easy. In a nutshell, you have a text file, and you use the open function to go ahead and open that file. You read it in. You can read it in three different ways. Uh, you can read in the entire file, you can loop over it line by line, or you can store it in a list. And uh, the, the last one is necessary if you're going to want to be manipulating at, a, um, at, at other points outside of the with state or the with block, if you would. All right, my friends. Well, that's, uh, that's my rendition of the first part of this chapter. 
uh, over and out. Thank you very much. Goodbye.